um, about how to talk about students, um, or to talk with students about those issues. Um, and so we're going to give you some information about that. My name is Jacqueline Reynolds. I am the Assistant Director for the Office of Academic Integrity. And I'm also an instructor in the English Language and Training Academy um, in the Office of Global and Immersive Studies. Um, I teach uh, writing skills, communication skills, and research skills to international students mainly. Um, and I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Amanda Chaska. I'm a senior professorial lecturer in the Writing Studies Program in the Department of Literature and the College of Arts and Sciences, which is her pronoun. I also have a faculty fellowship with the Center for Community Engagement Service, which is now the Center for Leadership and Community Engagement, uh, to work on the Working Washington Initiative from Strategic Conservative 7 that works on community learning research across the university. I work mostly with first and sometimes second third year students in first year writing courses, in creating learning courses, in complex problems, my complex problems class, and students that are in uh, I'm Julie Anderson. I'm a brand new faculty member. I joined last fall. I've got roughly 30 years of industry experience um, in finance. Uh, so came here to teach sustainable finance and also to be the associate program director for the master's in sustainability. I'm Sarah Gilchrist. I'm also a new faculty member. I'm in the library and I'm working primarily with graduate students from the School of International Service and the School of Public Affairs. I have 12 years experience as a librarian and a lot of other experiences, including working in student discipline. So I'm happy to be here. Right, so this is the agenda for our session today. Um, first, we're going to talk about questions. <clears throat> um, and then I'm going to give you information about something called faculty jurisdiction from the AIC policy, um, also known as a teaching moment for those of you who have been around for a while. Um, during that um, talk, I'm going to give you a pop quiz about your knowledge of policy related um, to academic integrity and students. Um, it's okay, there will be no grades. <laughs> Hopefully, just today, I'll send this information. Thank you. Um, after that, um, Sarah Gilbert is going to talk about research sources in AI from her experience in the library. And then Julie <clears throat> Anderson is going to talk about a case study from her own class about how she approaches teaching moments. Um, then Amanda Choka is going to discuss community based learning and experiential learning and the intersections of academic integrity to this class. Um, at the end of our session, which is really the focus of our session, we're going to do a role play. Um, we're going to demonstrate it, and then you'll be able to participate in role play. Um, we are discussing an academic integrity concern with the student based on um, what you heard from us and best practice. All right, so if you have questions, we've got some note cards around if you're here on the site. Um, <clears throat> but we also have a um, survey forum online for people who are in the audience to ask questions because this hasn't been structured as a Q&A. It's been more structured as um, um, offering our insights and then um, using what we've said in practice and role play. Yeah. Um, not to say questions aren't important, uh, but if you uh, use either the forum or a note card we gave you to ask questions, we will summarize the answers to those questions on the session website. And it also informs um, our office's programming for faculty, um, highlighting the things that they want to know and that they're concerned about in terms of talking to students about academic integrity. So those are sort of our two avenues for questions. If you have other questions, meaning um, about the new AIC policy, about academic integrity in general, and what the process is at AU for a specific concern in your classes, you can email the Office of Academic Integrity um, at academic integrity at american.edu, um, or you can email me because I am essentially the faculty liaison. I'm the one who receives um, questions and complaints from faculty when they have a concern in their class, and I'm happy to discuss that with you either over email or Zoom or even in person um, when that arises at any point throughout the semester. Okay. All right, so the first topic we're going to talk about is policy. Um, and these, this slide includes some excerpts from the Academic Integrity Code, um, specifically what is faculty jurisdiction. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sick. Um, 
um, in previous versions of the Academic Integrity Code, also known as AIC, faculty jurisdiction was called a teaching moment. Does anybody, is that familiar with anyone teaching moments? Yeah, I think you're nodding heads a little bit. <laughs> Um, the AIC says that faculty members may use the occasion to educate the students about acceptable standards for academic work. Um, the faculty member could, for example, require the student to rewrite or correct the original assignment or to submit a substitute assignment. And a faculty member may not, however, fail or level other raised penalties against the student for the assignment in the course. So essentially what that means is that you have a choice to talk to students about academic integrity concerns and have them rewrite portions of assignments if there has been some confusion about policy or confusion about skills, yet, skills that they don't have yet or haven't mastered yet. The other option is administrative adjudication by the Office of Academic Integrity. That involves great penalties. So our office is the only um, part of the university that can levy great penalties for academic Excuse me. Um, so the big difference is, um, one, faculty jurisdiction is um, an, an exercise that's a member and administrative adjudication for office involves raising <coughs> If you're not sure whether you should be applying faculty jurisdiction or administrative adjudication to concern one of your courses, thank you. Um, you can always email me and we can talk through that together. Um, it's difficult to make blanket like, statements about whether you should do one or the other because each um, situation has a lot of context and a lot of nuance. And so, really, we try to approach these individually. So, if you want to email me or email the office, you know, if you want advice, that's perfectly fine. <coughs> okay, so now we have a pop quiz. If you have your phone, um, we are happy to have the data from the quiz. I'm showing what you know and don't know. It asks for your name, but you can also answer anonymously by pressing skip. Um, so I'll give you a few minutes to record your answers. If you're not text heavy, that's fine. You can just think about your answers and then um, I'll give you some. Joy. It says it's waiting for your presentation. It's doing the presentation at night. Oh, it's not working? <laughs> so, okay. I think you join the presentation and then you can put the username if you want or you can skip it. Try clicking join and see. Okay, so you kind of press join and then skip if you don't want to put your name. Work. Waiting for Joy's presentation to begin. Oh, oh okay. Let's, right. let's skip that then. Just think about your answer. Sometimes this happens. As we all know at American University, sometimes technology fails. <laughs> And look at the first one together. So it says, it is a faculty member's choice to have a teaching moment with a student. By a show of hands, since we don't have the poll running correctly, um, who thinks it is a faculty member's choice? Oh, we have good students. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, it is a faculty member's choice in most cases um, to have a teaching moment with a student. One exception would be in cases, we call them multi party cases. It involves two students in two different sections with two different faculty members. If that's the case, I may kindly ask you um, not to have a teaching moment to preserve um, equity and fairness for students. So we don't have one student um, going to administrative adjudication while the other one um, is getting a teaching moment. That would be a case where I would uh, advise you against doing it. Um, but otherwise, it's generally your choice to have a teaching moment. Um, number two, the purpose of a teaching moment is to grill the student into a confession. Okay, 
show of hands, who says true? Huh? Okay, I hope that was clear enough. Um, <clears throat> generally, we don't want you to do that. Um, the focus on, of a teaching moment is on teaching, teaching a skill or teaching them about a policy um, that they're not following. Um, it, it's not um, trying to guilt them into contrition um, or something like that. Um, so when you have a teaching moment, you should go into it with the idea that you are going to teach them something. Number three, no one will find out if I penalize a student's grade for an AIP violation, again, which is against policy. Is that true or false? You want to say true? Okay. Um, if you penalize a student's grade, which is against policy, it is possible that no one will find out the first time or the second time. But when they do find out, a student can file a grievance um, against the faculty member because it's against policy. Only our office and levy um, academic sanctions against students. Um, number four, if a faculty member offers one student a teaching moment in one context, they should offer all students a teaching moment in the same or similar context. True or false? What do you think? True? Yeah, that one is true. And that's what I want to talk about for a second, just making sure um, that we're offering equitable um, opportunities for all students and being mindful of our biases and making sure um, that if we're offering a student um, a, a rewrite for a certain type of plagiarism on one assignment, if another student does something very similar or a very similar assignment, similar time of the semester, that um, we're offering them those same opportunities. And so it's just thinking about that in terms of your own practices as well. Um, number five, the purpose of a teaching moment is to teach students a skill to clarify a policy so they can complete the assessment again without violating the AI. True or false? True. Um, so the, the emphasis again is on teaching a skill or a policy that um, we either didn't know or didn't follow correctly for various reasons. Um, a lot of us think about policies in a very black and white way, but that's not necessarily um, uh, how students experience them. For example, um, a lot of professors have different rules about how to use AI in this conference in class. And your student may be used to one policy, um, but you have a very different policy. And even though you've said it somewhere deep in the syllabus, um, it may have been said, but it may not have been heard. So those are the kind of the examples of situations um, uh, where you could have a teaching moment with a student. All right, now I'm going to something over to Sarah Gilchrist. So, um, the library is here for all sorts of resources, including research, helping you find sources, and I wanted to talk about some of the issues that we've seen in the library that have to do with AI. Um, so, let's see. We, you may have already heard about some of these things, but we can talk about source hallucination, which is just a fun way of saying that chat GPT takes pieces of things and puts them together in a whole new source and it may not have anything to do with actual research that's being done but it, it might be using the names of actual researchers or actual journals and this started popping up in interlibrary loan when people were requesting copies of sources that chat GPT and other AI generator tools were telling them were good sources for their topic. So we want to keep in mind that there isn't always accuracy. Um, and this teaching moment is that we can teach students to view their citation, not only to increase the accuracy, but to make sure that they understand why they're important and how it can help them track down other research and just to double check or fact check the things that they're getting online. This is true for anything even outside of AI. Um, and that goes along with this idea of using citations as evaluation tools. One of the things that I've noticed, I've taught undergrads and grad students for a long time, and I tell my students the very first place I look on your paper is your work cited list. And I do that because I want to see what the balance of your sources are, whether or not you took the time to put the right information in the right places, not 
not going to kick you out or give you an F. You put a comma in the wrong place, but if it's a mess and there are just a bunch of links, then that tells me that you didn't do enough work to put the information together. So you can use the citation to detect whether or not they've used ChatGPT or an AI generator because you can track down certain sources or look up certain sources, and if they're just wholly fabricated, that can give you an opportunity for a teaching moment or an opportunity to send the student this adjudication. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about lateral reading, which is a term that we use a lot in the library world, but that's where you don't just look within the source, you look outside of the source to verify the information. So we want to do that with students' papers too. We're not just looking at the things that they have there, but we're doing this sort of fact checking for things that we know are about. And that's something that we can do, that's something that we can teach students to do, and that's all in their understanding of the um, Now, one of the other things that I always tell students is we, we would run through some scenarios, and one of the ones that students would just copy. Really, is that right? Why? Tell me why. And I said, well, what if they had copied from Wikipedia or ChatGPT and they just put quotes around it and then they cited it? Then is that plagiarism? And that's not plagiarism. It's bad paper writing, but <laughs> it's not plagiarism. So teaching them how to use quoting and citing correctly uh, helps them learn citation and evaluation skills, but it also helps them see like why it's important to value this information, why it's important to attribute things to the As things become more and more generated by AI, uh, it's even more important to attribute sources to the um, And I'm sure this whole conference has been about AI. There are just a few things that I've learned about in, I've only been here <laughs> one semester, but that we've been talking about. We're already including AI in database searches, probably in most of the things that you're using, or an algorithm to, uh, to find information. So we need to be aware of where it already is and how it's affecting our search results. Um, and that means that we need to figure out, try to find out what the input information is. Where are they getting the information? What's the subset of the information? Is it the whole internet? Is it a curated set of sources? There's a very big difference. We need to, and we need to teach our students to do this too. We need to figure out what the output is like. What sorts of sources is it giving us? Are they accurate? Are they what we asked? Try and figure out a little bit about the design or the logic behind that. And then compare what we're getting in one research tool to another research tool. And I say research tool in quotes because Google is a research tool and it's using AI. Our databases, everybody wants to have AI right now. So they're including some sort of artificial intelligence in their search. And it gets in the way a lot of times. Um, I worked with a professor in the School of Public Affairs, and she was using some of these AI research tools in her classroom. So there are things that are specifically created for research. I'm not saying that these are great. I'm just saying this is what some people are using. So if you do find something and you've done the evaluation, then that's, that's really good. And you can kind of help our students understand a little bit deeper information about their information. Um, we also want to be mindful of the campus resources. So the library is here, but also using the writing center. We're all in it together so we can help each other. So you're not alone. I, I think we mentioned that just because you ask about a plagiarism case doesn't mean that you have to follow through with it. So check with us. If we don't know, librarians will help you find somebody. And I wanted to talk a little bit about assignment redesign. One of the things that we do as good instructors is when we get that feedback where like maybe students aren't understanding the assignment and it's resulting in something that looks like plagiarism or not 
of an integrity violation, that can help us remember to teach students about academic integrity skills um, and then build that throughout the semester. I think we have crossed the learning threshold a long time ago about plagiarism and academic integrity, hopefully, because we're all here. So we forget what it was like to not know about this or not think about this. So there are some really simple ways that we can get our students check to see where they are, you know, individual students who are the whole classroom, chances are if one student is having a problem with their walk you through sort of what happened to me. I mentioned at the beginning that, that I'm a new professor and I, I taught at Georgia State uh, before during my degree, but new to AU. So my first semester here, there's a cheating scandal. I'll call it a scandal. So here's the scene of the potential crime. So um, the way it's related to AI is that I administer my test online in class. So they're sitting in class, they go online and they're answering, and I said closed book, everything, right? Um, what I find is that I can see that they're going off the Canvas site and they're potentially looking up other information. So I see this and I'm like, really? And you know, I'm shocked. So I stop the class and I say, okay, everyone, I see that some of the students are going off the site. Suppose with the exam, please stop. So I know at whatever, 1024, they stopped, right? And then we have, um, we have the, the class is over and the exam is over. And then I, because I have that stop point, I can grade them up until that point and after that point. And there was like a cliff, right? Like 80% right and then like 30% right. So my suspicions were pretty high. And I also saw some sort of copy paste. Like I put the quotes around and put it in Google and there was the cliff. So I knew that they had done this. So, or I suspected, I didn't know. I didn't have proof, but I was faced with what I should do. So the first thing I did do was call academic integrity. And, um, you know, I was nervous about this. A lot of professors were like, once you do that, you know, there's no way back. But Jack, Jacqueline really helped me through what I could do. So I wanted to say a couple of things that I did. So the first thing that I did, which is an old mothering, a lot of this is my mothering skill, was I asked each student who had left the browser to email me and set up a meeting. So I put the onus on them. I said, you know who you are, I need you to email me and set up a meeting. So now they're sweating and they're slowly trickling in with the email. Um, so I wanted, and then I, I needed to buy time also. So I ignored them for a week. And, you know, the pressure is building. They're thinking, am I being turned in? I, you know, the stress is building. So I needed that week to figure out what to say. So again, in thinking about how do I approach this teaching moment, because it's not like it's easy. I came up with sort of three things. So the first one is I wanted them to understand the risk of their behavior. So every decision we make as humans involves risk. So I really wanted them to understand, you made this snap decision during the exam, what risk did you take on in doing that? So think about the consequences of their actions. The second thing is I wanted to enforce empathy because I was struggling. I was personally struggling with this because of their actions. I was now struggling. I wanted to show that they, their actions affect others and that I care about them and I wanted them to hear my perspective. Um, so again, how they think others. And the last thing was the learning element. So I really wanted to focus on knowledge over grades. And I say that because university is a bubble. It is a wholly separate entity than the real world. And grades versus knowledge, there's a, there's a massive difference. So part of that is how can I help them to grow up and learn out what it's going to be like. So um, again, let's just break this out. So think about the consequences of their actions. So there was two courses of action. One is this one, the student's access to outside material on the exam. And so what are the consequences of doing that? The first one, um, as we talked about, is administrative adjudication. So here I outline it. But basically, your life is going to get difficult. You're going to have to defend yourself. There's going to be a committee, a panel. You can be suspended, dismissal, death of grade. You may not graduate if this is the class you need to graduate. 
situation. And then I added shame because I said, look, you know, this, this is difficult. You're going to have to go through this process and you don't know the outcome. So I wanted them to know, again, I'm not casting judgment. You're in the room with me. And I said, this is one of them. The other one is faculty jurisdiction. So I could let you retake the exam. I could um, let you correct the exam, like go back and, and redo it the exam, which I was letting other students do. Or I could let you take a new exam. And let me tell you that every single student basically admitted, like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I did that. Please, I want to do, I want to do option number two. I want to do faculty jurisdiction. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, but before we do, I want to talk about the op other option that you did that was another outcome. And that is, you could have just followed the rules to a closed book. So what would have been the downside risk of having done this? Here you can see, like, number one, okay, you got a bad grade on the exam. Well, you can make it up throughout the class. You can do better in other assignments. You could ask for extra credit. You can engage more. And I also told them, I said, getting a bad grade in a tough class is great interview material. When they say, what are you not good at? In Dr. Anderson's class, boy, was I not good at exam one. And let me tell you what it's taught me. So I said, getting a bad grade. At the time, you might have thought the downside risk was much more than it actually is, and what you chose had way more downside risk. So, um, again, the damage to your credibility can be long and lasting if you take one decision versus grades don't matter in the big picture. Okay. So, I wanted to give them that context. So, that, again, they're all they're in this one on one meeting with me, and then they say, Oh, please let me take the exam again. I'm like, really? You know, like that's work for me, and do you deserve that? Right? You've done something, and now I'm the one putting in hours. It's a 60-question exam. You know, I've got to redo this. So that's when I went into the empathy bit. So I just share a couple with you here. These were long, hard conversations. But I said, look, I'm emotionally distraught. They knew that. I looked distraught. I, I didn't know what to do. Um, part of it was because what if my decision to administratively adjudicate materially altered the course of their lives? So half of my students are master's students from Ghana, Nigeria, other places in Europe, right? So if I send them on this adjudication path and they end up suspended, being sent home to Iowa is different than being sent home to a foreign country when you're on a visa. And I told them that I worry about that. I don't want to be the one who's responsible for this. It's your behavior, but now I'm the one who's going to do this. So I went through some other things, you know, I'd have to rewrite the exam. Um, I also told them that again with the credibility, like, whether or not you did this and actually cheated, I'm not going to make that decision. Now I have doubt in my mind. And if you have to ask me for a letter of recommendation for, for an internship or a job, how, how do you think I should feel? If you were me, would you write that letter? Um, what are some other things? Oh, other students would feel like, Again, the quote unquote cheaters got a second chance. They get to retake the exam. Wow, they get another two weeks to study while you write it. Not, not exactly fair for the students to study. Um, moral obligation and reputation as a professional. Um, this was really big for me. I said, look, in finance, um, which I spent my entire career, when you're a supervisor, if somebody who reports to you has an ethical violation and you do not report that to FINRA or the SEC, you are equally liable. Fines, sanctions, getting kicked out of the industry, not being allowed to practice, and jail time, depending on that. So I said, look, this is the difference between academic and real world. There are real consequences. And these are all mostly finance students. Um, and then the last thing I did, this, this little gym box that I just showed up, this one was the kicker. So we're on this emotional roller coaster in the, in the room, and I said, okay, think of somebody that you really, really admire. It could have been a professor, it could be your mother, your grandmother, your uncle. What if they were sitting right there during this conversation? And oh, you should have seen the pain on their face. So again, my point in the, in the mothering of this is how do you make this learning opportunity sticky? So now I've really got them engaged. And the last thing I'll show you, I think I'm running up on my time, is again this idea that knowledge over grades. So one of the things that I did was for the questions that I that I had a suspicion that they had gone off and gotten somewhere else. I just asked them that question. I said, so how do you define 
whatever. Well, and it, it couldn't answer it. I said, you know, here, here is the problem. If you go out in the real world and you say, I took Dr. Anderson's sustainable finance class, and they say, great, the interviewer says, that's great, tell me what you learned, or hey, what about this concept? And you can't answer that question. You're undermining the credibility of American University, of this master's program, of my reputation. And the only thing that is going to get you a job in the future is the knowledge in these classes. So again, I'm going to wrap it up and I'll just go through some things. But basically, it was, again, this idea of what, what's, what are you here for? And it really is the knowledge. And I underline number four. No one has ever asked me what grade I got in class. In fact, I'm irritated by that because I was uh, so from Laudy undergrad, which was like 40 years ago. But I get good grades, and it doesn't matter. Nobody cares that I got great grades in my undergrad or my master's. So to remind them that, that it's really the knowledge that can help them get the job. So I just wanted to share that as a case study, um, and I will turn it over. All right, hold up. Uh, my part is going to be a little more niche, uh, but as more of us explore experiential learning, and hopefully community learning at the university, we're going to see more of these cases. So spiritual learning, especially community learning and research courses and the community service learning program, add on credit, they're going to offer more unique AIC situations. I think especially spiritual learning, it can be harder at times to fabricate these community experiences, especially because you're engaging different communities in BC, you're working in different offices, your students might be doing practicums or internships, they might be having experiences that are harder to fabricate. That said, students in the past have falsely locked hours, reported earlier experiences instead of occurring partnerships, or embellished reflections. Embellishing reflections, especially in a spiritual learning course, is really something to keep me aware of. Um, it's a violation of the code, but it can be tricky. It's an interesting moment. It may happen with, for instance, my students volunteer in an after school program, they volunteer with children from 5 to 12 years old. If anyone's been around a five-year-old lately, they can say some pretty wild things. Um, it can be hard to double-check what a five-year-old says. Uh, at the same time, there's probably going to be some kind of staff person or another classmate or another person there at the same time that can hopefully corroborate ideally the more outlandish ideas. That said, some pretty interesting situations happen with experiential right. It's kind of the beauty and the dangers of class. Uh, so we want to encourage you to give your students the benefit of the doubt, uh, but if something does seem extreme, if something seems just too good to be true, a little too over the top, a little outlandish, have a conversation with your students. If you're sending your students into any kind of community setting, uh, community learning, an internship, if they're doing that fourth credit, you should be having a conversation with them about the experience. That is part of the learning that happens in experience of learning. Okay. Um, the other aspect is memory is tricky. Two people can go through the same incident. Uh, we talk about this a little bit later in my class. It has very wildly different impressions of what happened. So especially for your students, I'd say, please, please, please push them to accurately record their experience as accurately as possible in the moment. Okay. Uh, one tool that we have, which is helping at least illuminate what is going on during the session, is Jim Pulse. It's a tracking tool. It's embedded in Canvas. It's available across the university. We're using it to track service hours for community learning classes, the community service learning program. Internships are also being used to track this. I expect we'll also be seeing this for more experiential learning classes as it rolls out farther. Uh, one thing that many of us do, we create check in due dates to keep students on track for hours, especially for community learning courses, internships, practicum. If they're doing project-based courses or project-based <coughs> courses, you can also have them log projects. Slightly different process, but it's still an option. Uh, regular check-ins, like the idea of hour binging or falsifying information. Uh, one example last semester, my students have four different check-ins for the 20 hours they required to complete the course, the course. So we'll do five, 10, 15, final day of class, 20 hours, because we can require service hours after final or during final. One student hadn't logged hours since mid-October, so his hours were showing as incomplete. So we went back, he explained, you know, part of this is that I just have been really behind, and he kind of goes to this from class. There was other academic issues, and I said, you know, I hear you, but at the same time, this has been 
be a lot trickier to check your hours. So he went back, added all of his hours, and then I had to double check the hours with the community partner with their attendance sheet and the email. That said, you should be regularly communicating with community partners or people supervising internships, on site staff, anyone doing any form of experience learning. You should have an ongoing dialogue. Uh, one thing to keep in mind if you are having students log any type of hour, project can be false. Not all partners verify hours are being false. As a professor, this is something to keep in mind you're grading the student, not the partner. You should be confirming the hours with partners and having regular conversations. Especially if there are any challenges that your students are experiencing. Uh, examples might be transportation, attendance. Uh, last year, one of my classes, we had a COVID wave go through class, which many of us had. There were some issues with hours. I was regularly talking to the partner. They're not trying to not show up. They generally do have eight people down with COVID right now because they're in the teaching right now. So, generally, having these open conversations with your partners about any student concerns, unusual attendance from your students. If there's something that seems odd and a good pulse record. Uh, one example, I had a trans student in one class this year who had an interesting story about the children who got off the school bus before they were entering that school program. And the kids have been talking about pronouns on the school bus, which if you've ever been on a school bus with five to 12 year olds, they can again have some pretty interesting conversations. So it was a very organic conversation. The kids were talking about how they had an art teacher at school who was non-binary. They knew they had a volunteer who was trans. And they came into the after-school program that day, and everyone was very worked up and upset about pronouns. And some kids got pronouns and trans and non-binary issues, and some did not. And the students' report and give polls was pretty long. It was about two paragraphs, and I chatted with them afterwards. I chatted with some staff. I was genuinely checking the students for their own well-being and safety and health. But also, it seemed like somebody as a staff member didn't know about it. I wanted them to be clued in. But that is the sort of thing, too, where that might be something someone could embellish at some point. And I would want to be checking the staff on what's going on. I will be honest, the embellishing often happens more with white students than in the predominantly black community and under resourced issues. So that's something to keep in mind. And then, last part here CBL courses. Reflection is required for a community based learning course. I have some hyperlinks in here to show what's required for a community based learning course. If you're interested in community based learning and research courses, or you have colleagues who are, this will take you for, to the former Center for Community Engagement and Service, now Center for Leadership and Community Engagement website, where you can review the eight criteria. Uh, but some suggestions to keep people honest, to minimize the embellishing that often happens. Uh, to keep people on track and accurately reporting their experiences. Ask students to synthesize connections between the academic texts and what they're seeing in the community. So for instance, especially uh, after the incident with the trans student and the kids on the school bus, you read one text from Audre Lorde and she was talking about the challenge of being a black queer woman and why this was an issue, why the children were less familiar with queer issues and pronouns, and why this was such a challenge for them. And they were working through these ideas. Honestly, really smart reflection looking at these different concepts. Things like to give pulse logs, grade and reflection assignments, in class reflection activities, check in with students and their experience. Often, if your students are doing this work with others, people will chime in during class, people might correct people. Uh, it's happened often where students say, like, Oh, I see what you're saying, but I think actually this happened here, or maybe this was what happened. So the students are also keeping each other honest. Especially because they realize they're working in communities they don't belong to, and there's an even greater need for honesty and accuracy here. Um, in student classes, discussion based reflection is a good place to work through some of these more complicated issues. If you're coming up on something and you realize your students may need more instruction on something, it's a good way to figure this out together. Uh, again, this is my big thing memory is fallible. Uh, so you need to encourage students to observe and accurately record their experience. They can't be talking for or speaking for people that they're volunteering with or even their classmates. They need to be thinking about what they are observing and seeing and thinking and feeling. They can't assume what a child is thinking or feeling. They can report what they may have said, example, the school bus conversation. But again, even my student doesn't exactly know, no one knows, other than the children who are there, what was actually said on that school bus. We know the impact it had when the children got to tutoring that day. 
in my trans student who's then the center of attention. Yes. And there's a few hyperlinks throughout here. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. So Sarah and I are going to demo a teaching moment. So I'm reading Sarah's paper. A little concerned about some of the sources. There's what we think might be hallucinated sources, so if you can to chat GPT, the link to the references may not work. I've done my best as a writing studies professor for 15 years. I cannot find these sources anywhere on the internet. If I can't find something on the internet, then it's not. So I've asked Sarah to come to office hours to talk about her writing process and her research process and how the Google went.
we're still going to come to the director of the classes where the right in actual performance practice based classes. Oh, cool. Rarely in that sort of shape.